Uh, thanks everyone for coming to, uh, to tonight's uh, talk about Pat, the Pat Bar. Uh, I'm half by PLA, the uh, Intellectual Property Law Association here at GGU and uh, Law School Career Services and Jared. Um, we present uh, John M. White, partner at Bernardo and White. I'm assuming that's the white in the name. <laughs> and the academic director of uh, PLI's uh, Pat Bar uh, course review. So he's here to tell you guys everything. Enjoy. Okay, now the red light is not on, but you're it is. All right, hello out there in TV land. Um, I'm the roving patent attorney. I uh, travel the country and speak at all schools and tell people uh, about what it is to be a patent attorney and what it is to prepare for and take the patent bar exam. My talk divides into two parts. About 20, 25 minutes uh, is on the patent bar exam that I have maybe 10 or 15 minutes on careers. And then uh, we can take questions. So let's begin with uh, a chat about the uh, patent bar exam. The exam has been around for a long time. Uh, by now, probably about 80 years. It was begun in the 1930s and with a little break for World War II, it's been given pretty much twice a year ever since. But in 2004, it became uh, electronic, so it's available any day of the week that you can find a place called Prometrics open. Prometrics, that's the, uh, the proctor of the exam at this point. And so uh, you can take it on uh, any day of your choosing, kind of like going to the DMV to get your license. So uh, nothing is holding you back from taking this exam, right? You just have to prepare for it, find a day, and knock it out. So what is the exam? Well, by now, it's 100 questions. That's it. 100 multiple choice questions. And you think to yourself, multiple choice? Well, give me the answers. How hard could that be? All I have to do is pick the right one. Uh, even better, uh, during the exam, when you're answering the questions, they give you access to the book that is the source of all the questions. This is a book called the Manual of Patent Examining Procedures. So it's a test where they give you the answers, they give you the book, they write the questions from, and you only need a 70 to pass. A 70. How hard could it be? They give you the answers, they give you the book, and you only need a 70. That's one point away from a 69. This is doable, right? So what's the pass rate on this exam? Well, it's 50%. 50%. Now, that's a morale-breaking number. The reason that's a morale-breaking number is it's lower than any state bar exam, for sure. But it's morale-breaking because the people who sit for this exam, uh, without exception, have never failed anything in their life. That's why they're able to take this exam, you see. Everybody in the room taking the exam uh, has a technical background, either a science or engineering degree, like chemistry, physics, biology, something like that, or an engineering degree. Half the test takers have that, plus they've been to law school and they've taken and passed one or more state bar exams. 10 to 15 percent of the test takers have PhDs. So this is the most talented group of test takers you could assemble. And yet they take this exam and they go down like wheat into a harvester. What seems to be the problem? Well, let's talk about the nature of the exam. Number one, open book. Whenever anyone offers you an open book exam, you should decline. And the reason is because it's a false promise. If you could really look at that book, you'd all pass, right? Eventually, you'd find the answer in there somewhere. You know, you'd flip through it enough, you'd you know get to the index, find the answer. So. Whenever you're facing an open book scenario, it's a false promise that you'll be able to look at it. Sure, you'll be able to look at it some, but for the most part, it will be a distraction. So the truth on this exam is you'll be able to look up five questions in the morning, 50 questions, five in the afternoon, 50 questions. So 10 questions you get to look up out of the six hours and 100 questions. That means 90 questions come from your memory of that book which is 3,000 pages long. So it's a big book. And the Patent Office has added to it by now. They have uh, added about 1,200 pages to the 
the MPEP with respect to Federal Register notices about the things that have um, come into being since the last edition of the MPEP that has popped out. So there's plenty to learn to get ready for this exam. Now let's uh, visit the 70 that you need to pass this thing. After all, 70 still seems like a uh, pretty reasonable number. All right. In 1999, they gave the exam 100 questions on paper, and the pass rate was 13%. That's a 1 followed by a 3, 13%. They threw out two questions for ambiguity, whatever, and the pass rate leaped to 38%. So what that tells you is, at least in 1999, and that was a pretty tough exam, I guess, um, the three out of four people who passed that year did so with a 70 or a 71. And so what you have to understand about grade distribution on this exam is most people who pass do it with a 70 or 71. No one gets a 75. Just doesn't happen. And sadly, most people who fail do it with a 67, a 68, or a 69. There's no real distribution on this exam. Rather, Nobody scores very low. There's a column of scores right around 70, and no one scores very high. So the passing margin is typically a question or two. A failing strategy is someone who gets to question 47 in the morning, question 48 in the afternoon, they get a 68. Had they finished, they would have passed, but they didn't, so they didn't. That is a patent bar experience, fairly typical. So, the exam, how do you sign up for it? I mean, now that you know this is something you want to do, who wouldn't want to take an exam that has a 50% pass rate? Right? How do you sign up for it? Well, here's how you sign up for it. You need this document that I have right here. It's called the General Requirements Bulletin. General Requirements Bulletin. There's a couple of ways to get this uh, document. You can go to the USPTO website, which is uspto.gov. That's uspto.gov. Go to the Office of Enrollment and Discipline, OED, or you can go to our website, pli.edu, go to our bar review, patent bar review area, and we have a link that takes you right to the same document. So what is this document? Well, number one, it's paper, so you gotta print it out. Uh, you can download it, but eventually you have to fill it out in paper and send it in. There's no electronic sign-up for this exam. You gotta do it all. Uh, via paper and snail mail and all that sort of thing. So what does it require? Well, it requires money on the order of uh, $400, I think it's $390, but $400 is a good round number. It requires you to fill in this application and then it requires that you send in a record of your undergraduate transcripts. Your undergraduate transcripts, not your graduate degree, your undergraduate. Doesn't matter what country it's from, what matters is that it's your undergraduate experience. Now, what they're looking for is evidence of your technical background, and it divides into three categories. Category A, Category B, Category C. Category A is an automatically qualifying degree, and I'll read them, and if you fall out, either as a BS or a BA, you're in. Biology, biochemistry, botany, some computer science, not all, Electronics technology, food technology, general chemistry, marine technology, microbiology, molecular biology, organic chemistry, pharmacology, physics, textile technology, and almost any engineering degree, almost. Military engineering is not on here, and neither is financial engineering, which you probably didn't know existed, but in fact, you can get a degree in financial engineering from Columbia. See, now you know. That's where all that stuff came from. All right, well, let's suppose you don't have an automatically qualifying degree. What do you do? Well, you can still take the exam. You have, you have a degree in something else. So what would that something else be? Well, it doesn't matter. But what matters is on the way to getting it, you accumulated coursework, which is an approximation of a degree in one of the qualifying topics. So I'll give you a, for instance. Let's suppose you have a degree in mathematics. On the way, you accumulated 24 semester hours in physics. It's plausible, you know, physics is applied mathematics. Why not, you know, maybe you did. 
And so you could take the exam. You don't have a degree in physics, but you have a degree in something else, and you accumulated courses in physics. Well, let's suppose you don't have 24 semester hours in physics. You have 21 or 18. What do you do? You pick up the missing physics courses at a local junior college. No requirement that you go to a big state school or enroll, you just fill in the blanks. But it has to be physics that would be given credit toward a degree in physics. You know, it can't be physics for history majors or, you know, admiring reflections of Albert Einstein. It's got to be physics that will, you know, get you a lab and get you a degree in that or uh, an engineering curriculum, something like that. The other uh, things under category B, Option two, you have a degree in something and you have 32 semester hours in a combination of eight hours in chemistry or eight hours in physics plus 24 semester hours in biology, botany, microbiology, or molecular biology. Now, who are you? You're probably a nurse or pre-med. You're on your way to medical school, but this is law school, okay? So if you hadn't checked, you're in law school. Uh, there's option three. You have a degree in something, but somehow you also have 30 semester hours in chemistry. I can't imagine who you might be, okay? But maybe you distill things at home. I don't know. But uh, you somehow have 30 semester hours in chemistry. Option four is sort of a grab bag. It's 40 semester hours in a combination, eight hours in chemistry or eight hours of physics plus 32 semester hours in a combination of chemistry, physics, biology, botany, microbiology, molecular biology, or engineering, plus computer science coursework uh, is now potentially exceptional. So who are you? We don't know, but you roamed around your undergraduate uh, pursuit, changing majors maybe every other year. Finally, you left your parents delighted. In any case, you have a degree in something and you have lots of credits and stuff. Uh, maybe you started in double E and then you switched to uh, you know, computer science and then you decided on physics, you know, I don't know. But uh, you're a multi-talented person in the patent office would likely accept you. And if you're, again, if you're missing something in your patchwork of uh, technical coursework, fill in the blank. Then there's category C. Now, invariably, there's always an other. And what is other? Well, other is practical engineering or scientific experience. But what this really is, is you've taken and passed the fundamentals of engineering exam. Now, that is the first exam on your way to becoming a licensed professional engineer in a state. So um, if you've taken and passed that, you can sit with this exam. Who would do that other than an engineer? Well, an architect, maybe. Okay, so there are other ways um, to qualify for this, but uh, that typically is the way an architect might do it. All right, so you are category A, B, C. Does that matter with respect to um, what you do once you're a patent attorney? And the answer is no. You can do anything you want. Your technical background doesn't matter. It just matters that you have it, so you can take the exam. So you send in your Transcripts, you send in your money, you send in your filled in application, what happens? Well, category A, you hear back in about a week to 10 days. And uh, really, you're automatic. All they're doing is cash your check, you're in. Category B and C, they have to look at what you've submitted, so it may take three to four weeks. What they send back for anybody, though, is the same thing. It's a mailing that gives you 95 days, five days for mailing, and then 90 days to contact, schedule, and take your exam at that ProMetric facility. Now, there's 500 or so of these places around the country. And uh, there's one near you, there's one near where you're gonna be over a summer or a break, you know, there's one out there somewhere and they'll have a seat for you, but you have to arrange for it within this 90-day window. Okay, so 90 days. Can you find a free day in 90 days to take an exam? And the answer is yes. You're busy, but you're not that busy. Okay, you can find a Saturday in there somewhere. All right, so what's the problem about taking this exam? It's preparing to take this exam. Preparing to take this exam, I used to say, could be done a couple of ways. You could prepare on your own. 
get some old exams, get a copy of the MPEP, and just have at it. 300 hours. That's your summer if you have nothing else to do. You know, you're not working somewhere, you're not in classes. 300 hours. That's pretty much your summer. But really, that's no longer feasible, and here's why. The exam has become a moving target. It used to be a static target. Up until last year, it tested a vintage issue of the MPEP, one that was about four or five years old. And that's what it tested. You could get some old exams, you could look at the old MPEP, and you could pass. But the exam has changed in that now it tests a current version of the MPEP, whatever it is, Plus, it tests any guidelines or other publications that the Patent Office believes has risen to the level of testability in their estimation. So what does that include? By now, the most recent MPEP and 14 Federal Register notices that total by now about 1,200 pages. This is mostly the result of the passage of the AIA, the America Invents Act, that was passed just last year. The second phase of it has just been implemented, and so the exam will start testing it literally next week, October 2nd. The next element of the AIA goes into effect next March, March 16, 2013. So there's kind of an interim window here that you can uh, take the exam, and then the final big push of this American Invents Act gets tested after March next year. So if you want to take it soon, I would say, if you can, plan to get it out of the way by next March. You'll have less to learn. If it doesn't work out for you, you know, that's the way it goes. Regardless, though, my suggestion is that you're going to have to take some sort of course. Simply because if you prepare on your own and you spend the 300 hours and the three months that, that reflects, the Patent Office is only guaranteeing you 90 days of consistency. That is, they've reserved for themselves a 90-day notice period where they can say, hey, the exam is moving on to these new topics. And so you may find yourself ready for an exam they're not giving. You know, so my advice is take a course because that shortens up your prep time to about 150 hours. All right, that's a half your summer. It's something you can do over winter break. It's something you can get a jump on at spring break. But it's more feasible than 300 on your own. So if you're going to do this, pick a course that works, and then pick a course that fits your personality. These courses, including ours, are given in live and home study format. Now, what you learn is the same, but how it's administered is different. Home study requires you to do it on your own. you got to motivate yourself to stick with it. you got to work it into your existence, your schedule, and you have to hang in there until it's over. Whereas a live course, you show up like a class, and it happens. Over the course of five days, you take it. By the end, you've been exposed to every tested topic. You're not ready for the exam, but at least you know what's coming, and now you work on your memory, you can go over your notes again, and you begin to practice on software to get yourself ready for the actual exam. So, for me, I would require the live course because it's an organizing principle. You put it on your calendar, it shows up, you show up, you make it happen, you're done. Whereas home study, uh, you gotta, you know, hang in there. A couple hours every day, get through the lectures, get through the notes, and then finally do the test prep on the software. But when do you have that 150 hours? Well, this isn't something that's just gonna show up, okay? So you have to plan ahead, you have to think, how busy am I going to be over this period of time, over that period of time? And look into the future. Look at your calendar. Look at your schedule. And determine when is it feasible. Now, what is 150 hours? Well, if you treated this test prep just like you did a three-credit law school course, three credits, you would be able to knock it out in the span of about 14 weeks. Providing you treat it like a three credit law school course should be treated, which is a few hours a day, not leave it until the week of finals, whereupon you buy the book and ferociously start thumbing it. Now, this is something you have to do drip by drip, a few hours a day over the course of 14 weeks. Now, the reason I mention that is you can get it out of the way before finals, you see. And then you can go about your ordinary taking the finals and that sort of thing. 
Or if you're not going to quite get it done, put off the actual exam until after finals. But in any case, you can get your prep done while you're getting anything else done over the semester in law school. Um, now, how do our students do? Well, our students do pretty well. They, about 85% of them pass first time out, either live or home study, regardless. But, look, the pass rate is good, but here's why. It's good because we have students that commit the time. That's the start and end of it. The course tells them what they need to know, but the course doesn't take the exam they do. And there's no shortcut. If you're real smart, no, it's not going to take you 100 hours. If you're real smart, it's going to take you 150. And that's just the way it is, maybe 170. So it's going to take considerable effort, but do you want to put it off? You may say, ah, you know, I'm busy. I got other stuff going on. I'm in law school. Let's wait till it's over. Okay. You're going to take it past the regular bar, and then you're going to be working. All right, how much free time do you have now in your first years as a lawyer? Probably less than you have now, right? You know, because those first few years as a lawyer, your time is not really your own. It's spoken for. So when, then, will you find the 150 to 170 hours to get ready for this thing? Do you think your firm is going to be indulgent, give you some time here and there to get ready? They might pay for a course, but that's about the limit of their indulgence. You know, they're, they're going to rely on you to find that time. So, and you want to test with a 50% pass rate waiting for you after you finish law school and taking the bar and all that. Probably not. If it's going to be a swing and a miss experience, do it while you're in law school. You wait 30 days, you take it again. You know, that, that's, you pay your money again, but at least you can take it again after 30 days as opposed to the regular bar exam where you take it and you wait six months, you stare in the mirror, and, you know, self-loathing and reflection, what am I doing, and your mother calls, that sort of thing. So this is 30 days, you knock it out again, no one's keeping track and no one ever asks how many times you take it. <laughs> okay, it just happens. All right, so any questions about taking the exam, getting ready for it, what it is, or anything like that? Yes? Um, these classes that you mentioned, um, we can go to the USPTO website and uh, find the classes or? No, the classes are taught by PLI, Practicing Law Institute. That's who I work for. And the Practicing Law Institute Center is two blocks away on Market Street. So for you here in San Francisco, it's astonishingly convenient. We're going to have a course at the end of October, and then again, I think, in February. So uh, for whatever reason, San Francisco has come up on our radar. But yeah, I, I have the trade. And just one more. Um, when For the transcripts that need to be sent, um, okay. if you transfer it, uh, but then end up with your BS in, uh, say, biology in your second school, is it just that they want to see that degree, or do they need transcripts from the first, both schools? They need transcripts that reflect all of your coursework that added up to that degree. And in all likelihood, you're where you got your degree will say these courses transferred and then you have the courses you took here and here's all the grades. You know? And this would also account for AP courses, advanced placement that you may have taken in high school or something like that that you got credit. Those count too. You know, whatever counted toward a degree, you know, they're they're happy with. So you have your transcript, evidence of the degree, you're in. Any other questions about the exam? If you take this PLI course, does it also cover the new AIA changes and all that? Does the PLI course cover AIA? Yes. Yes. And, and it's, uh, the AIA is coming fast and furious, and it's a very uh, profound change in the law. Um, just at a very high level, the American Events Act uh, changed many things about our patent system, but the thing it changed most is the role of the patent office in the patent system. The patent office has historically been a place where you filed applications, they looked at them, they issued patents, and their role was over. You know, that they didn't do anything further. But now the American Vets Act has put the patent office right in the middle of looking at patents after they've been issued and determining whether in fact they're valid. And so many Proceedings now will go on at the patent office that hadn't before. 
And not only are they proceedings, but they're inter-party proceedings. It can be one side or more against the other. You know, it can be two-party proceedings, three-party proceedings. I mean, it's going to be a free-for-all back in the patent office. Now, uh, the other aspect that changed is we go from a first to invent system to a first to file system, so that has changed. And then uh, the other major aspect is the owner of the application, as opposed to the inventor, now assumes the role of controlling the application. So several things changed, and the fundamental problem about uh, teaching people to pass an exam is Patent Office has a one million case backlog that will be subject to the old laws and rules. This will dissipate over about four or five years. But every new case that's filed is subject to the new laws and rules. So you have a parallel system going forward for about four or five years. So it, it, these will be interesting times. Interesting times. Yes. So what do you do? Uh, so presumably, once you pass. Uh, so what does that make you? You technically are you now a patent attorney? Or? You're an agent. You're patent a patent. Agent. Once you take and pass the exam, you're a patent agent. Okay. Once you take and pass the state bar, then your status changes from agent to attorney. I see. There's no difference in the patent office. Outside the patent office, an attorney can license, litigate, offer advice, do all that sort of thing. At the patent office, though, there's no difference between an agent and an attorney. So you can write and file applications and represent people at the patent office. And what that means if you're in law school is you can work part-time as a patent agent and you can develop a skill, which is very desirable. So when you're sitting in the interview room and they ask, uh, what can you do for us starting tomorrow that's going to make us money? You can say, I can write and file applications just like that guy over there. And I can start tomorrow because you already done. So it's a, it's a very marketable skill. And if you get it on your resume, you know, it's a clear indication of your seriousness about the field. You know, because getting registered is a not inconsiderable achievement. So there you go. Thank you. Yes? Can I, can I buy a board of the PLR courses now in Congress AIA? Because I studied for a little bit before, but I didn't like study so much that, like, so I need to study again, but I know the AIA. Uh, yes, I have supplements that are ready. They're going to be popping out probably in the next couple of weeks to cover the AIA. Just AIA. Yeah. You yeah. just have to contact Mark Dyke at our office. Mark Dyke. His email is m d i g h t o n at p l i m i g h t o n. Mark Dyke. M d i g h t o n. All right, any other questions about the exam, signing up for it? Everybody wants to take it, right? See, it works. All right, let's talk about careers in patent law. Huh? I'll give you my, uh, at this point, my best 10 minutes on careers in patent law. So, what does it take to succeed as a patent attorney? Well, be one, okay? There's a relative shortage of patent attorneys in this country uh, because they're not that common. Let's face it. Who goes and gets an engineering or science degree and then decides to go to law school? Or worse, gets a PhD, does a postdoc somewhere, and then decide to go to law school. Okay? This is just not something people would sign up for ahead of time. Okay? So being a patent attorney is a fairly rare thing. But once you get into the field, you're going to be in demand, and the demand is mostly as a result of your undergraduate discipline, because that is what clients need and what they focus on. Yes, you went to law school, check that box. Yes, you took and passed the state bar, check that box. But what they care about is, can you write up an application relating to my software? Can you convince a jury that my molecule is the same as that other person's molecule and get me some damages? You know, and that's all techno speak. That's nothing you learn in law school. So it's an interesting uh, career where most of it has to do with what you learned before you got to law school, despite you being called a patent attorney. All right. So where do you need to graduate in your class? Top hundred percent. Okay. Now, 
is that a little more broadly stated than it could be? You know, you got to be a good student, but basically finish law school, take it past the state bar, and then go prospecting for a job. But understand that your undergraduate degree is going to determine more where you end up than anything else. You got to be portable. So let's talk about what you do as a patent attorney and where you do it. Patent attorneys do one of two things generally. They prosecute applications, that's writing and filing applications at the PTO, or they litigate. Now litigating is like litigating anything. You wake up angry and you stay that way, you know, 10, 15 years. Eventually, uh, the anger wears off or maybe you change the decaf or something. In any case, uh, you can do either of these things, but typically you can't do them both at the same time. The reason is, Prosecution requires regular care of a docket of maybe two to three hundred cases that are pending at the USPTO. As office actions arrive, you report them to clients, you execute client instructions, replying to the patent office, you're that go-between and advisor. You can't leave it and go off and litigate and return to it when you're able. It requires constant care and feeding. On the other hand, litigation requires your total devotion while it's going on because it's an all-in thing. You're operating under the schedule of a court somewhere and sometimes those schedules can be fairly short and involve an awful lot of work in a very short period of time and you literally have time for nothing else. But you have to know how to do both, but you can't do both. It's kind of a Yogi Berra-ism. And it's this, the things you exploit in litigation are things that go right or wrong during prosecution. And likewise, the things you don't want to do that can lead to problems in litigation, you have to be aware of in prosecution. So you have to know how to do both, but you can't do both at the same time. What else can you do? You can do licensing and uh, deal making and you know, all that sort of thing. That's a new area of patent law, it's called transactional practice. And you know, 30 years ago, it really wasn't around very much. But now, with all the deals going down and companies being bought and patent portfolios being traded away, it's become uh, a more realistic and uh, you know likely career track for a patent attorney. So where do you do this work? Well, you do it in a general practice firm for the most part by now. General practice firms got into the patent game because there's a lot of money at stake. Over the last 20 years, money has shown up in the patent realm, and you can see it in the news, you know, big sums of money change hands. Um, well, general practice firms wanted a piece of that, so they went out and got themselves patent boutiques. These used to be standalone patent firms. Now, they're within a general practice firm. So what can you do there? Well, prosecution, litigation, transactional stuff if you want, but you can also do other stuff. Remember, it's a general practice firm, and you may have found something else interesting in law school other than patents, so, you know, might as well give it a go. All right, there are boutiques. Yes, boutiques are out there, and they can be very small, literally, a person or two, or they can be quite large, two, three hundred lawyers. Those exist in Northern Virginia, outfits like Oblon and Chagru and Finnegan. These are great big boutiques. All they do is patent work. What can you do there? Litigation, prosecution. At the smaller boutiques, if you want to do litigation, bear in mind that at some threshold of size, litigation just isn't going to happen or it's not likely to happen. If you have 10 or fewer attorneys, the odds of a litigation showing up on a, or a litigation showing up on a regular basis is probably not very high. So if that's really something you're interested in, tend to the larger places where they have the people power to throw at cases and, and get them going. Um, you could also work at a company in-house. So what do you do there? Probably prosecution, probably some transactional stuff. You're not going to do litigation. You're going to pay for litigation. You might manage litigation. You might write the occasional nasty letter, but you're not going to be taking depositions, arguing motions, or anything like that. That's going to be done by people you hire. Universities have tech transfer offices. You can work there. Write some applications, live on campus, not on campus, but live near a campus in a college town. You know, it's a fairly laid back lifestyle. Maybe do some licensing. You wouldn't do litigation. You, you might round up some witnesses or something, help with the document production, but you're not going to be uh, doing any litigation. Uh, the government, you can work for the government. Uh, the government spends 
well, probably a trillion dollars a year on uh, basic research, and they get lots of patents. And you may think, well, it's all defense. Not really. Uh, a lot of it is defense, but a lot of it isn't. You have Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, you have JPL, you have NASA, you have Sandia Labs, you have Los Alamos, you have Center for Disease Control, you have Nas uh, National Institutes of Health, you have lots of things that have nothing to do with defense. It's just straight up research and the government gets lots of patents. And then you have all the defense stuff. So Department of Navy, Army, Air Force, Naval Research Lab, that sort of thing. If you want to litigate for the government, you should uh, work at Department of Justice. They're the ones that litigate patents for the government. The Patent Office litigates, but only representing the Patent Office and only at the CAFC. That's uh, where patent appeals go from the Patent Office. Uh, if you, uh, another place to litigate the government is the ITC, International Trade Commission. They do ex uh, import exclusions uh, from the ITC in Washington. So if, that's, if you want to litigate for the government, those are the places to go. What do you get paid as a patent attorney? Well, the least you'd get paid would be in the government. So that's $160,000, $170,000 after you've been there for a few years, like five years or something. And then uh, the top of the food chain in terms of pay would be you're a litigator in a general practice firm. Your pay is a reflection of what you can collect, not what you bill. Billing is a fine number. You know, you can impress friends with it, the number that matters to the firm and ultimately to you is what can be collected, you see, because that is what you pay salaries with, rent and etc. collections, not billing. So where do you do it across the country? Well, Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia specifically is the largest concentration of patent attorneys in the country, about 20% uh, of them are there. All manner of jobs, big firms, small firms, boutiques, government, uh, a little bit of tech transfer. Not many companies, though. Washington is not a company town. Uh, you won't find many there. Yeah, a few, but mostly government-oriented, you know, government contractors and that sort of thing. Um, but all technical backgrounds are desired in Washington, so whatever your technical background is. And don't forget the patent office is there. It, it may not be a place you'd work forever, but it might be a place to start, you know, like clerking for a judge. And you're not going to do it forever, but for a few years you can do it. You can learn a lot about the PTO. Then there's New York. New York uh, has about a third of the number of patent attorneys and agents that the D.C. area does, uh, Northern Virginia. But um, they're in northern New Jersey, Manhattan, and then in Connecticut, Long Island. Many more company jobs, obviously. Pharma, chemical, and then firms, uh, for the most part, in the city in Connecticut. A few companies out on Long Island, as well as a few firms. Then uh, Chicago and the state of Illinois. There's about 2,000 patent attorneys in the state, uh, mostly around Chicago, but some out in Peoria. Big firms, small firms, companies. You know, Boeing is there. Um, and, you know, and you have a few uh, pharma outfits and uh, drug makers like Baxter and stuff like that. You know, Chicago, Motorola is headquartered there. For Next up would be the state of California, but. These other places I mentioned, uh, the D.C. area, New York, and Chicago, and all technical backgrounds. But when you get to the state of California, you have as many patent attorneys as Northern Virginia, but now your technical background will determine where you end up. So Bay Area, it's uh, electrical, computer science, physics, that sort of thing. You go down the state a little bit, Thousand Oaks, Santa Barbara, biotech. You'll find some biotech again in Newport, and then some down in San Diego. L.A is a little bit of everything everywhere, but LA is, is uh, you know, there's no there, there, it's, it's kind of all over. So you have some attorneys downtown, some in Pasadena, where you have JPL and Caltech. You got some in Century City, kind of on the way to Santa Monica, and then some in Santa Monica, and then you have some in Long Beach, and then you have some at, down in Newport. So it, it, it's kind of all over the LA region. San Diego has about 250, 300 patent attorneys by now. You have uh, Qualcomm, you have Scripps Institute, you have USD and UCSD, and then you have Department of Navy uh, attorneys down there. In the desert southwest, uh, not a lot going on. Uh, in Arizona, you have maybe four or 500. They're mostly in 
Phoenix. Motorola and Intel have some fabricating out there. You've got the golf equipment and some uh, geriatric care stuff. Uh, New Mexico, no one's out there except in uh, Albuquerque and Los Alamos. It's about 150 or so in Albuquerque, that's Sandia Lab, and, and the hangers on for that, you know, the firms that do that work. And likewise up in Los Alamos. Then you have Texas. Texas has about the same number as Illinois on the order of 2,000 between Dallas, Houston, and Austin. The preponderance, Dallas, oil and gas, chips, uh, software. Uh, Houston is all oil and gas. Don't bother unless you have a chemical or chemical engineering background. Austin, a bit more of a mix. Dell is down there, uh, University of Texas, and you know some startup stuff. They're, they're trying to get some things going down there in Austin. Arkansas has 10 patent attorneys. They're working for Tyson's Chicken and Walmart. Um, Louisiana has about 150 or so. Uh, they're in Baton Rouge. It's like a little post, uh, outpost from Houston. Mississippi has about 10, um, not many. Alabama, 70 or 80. What, what are they doing there? It's Huntsville, NASA, Rocket Town, yeah. And then you have Georgia, about 400, 500 by now, uh, all mostly around Atlanta, Center for Disease Control, every university, Georgia Tech, you know, stuff like that. Florida has about five or 600, maybe even 700 by now. What are they doing? Nothing, they're retired. So don't, don't look at the roles of they go, oh, look at all those patent in Florida. No, nothing's happening. Okay, they're they're uh, retired, nothing happens in Florida that needs a patent. It's real estate and tourism. It's a unique economy in the country. It's just, it's just an odd place. People go there and then they aren't there anymore. <laughs> it's the last stop on the railroad, okay? <laughs> and inventing is not on their agenda. All right, uh, what's next? The Carolinas. Uh, it may surprise you to know that South Carolina is the largest exporter of vehicles from North America. What do you think of that? Yeah. BMW is in Spartanburg, out in the western part of South Carolina. And so things are starting to go. It used to be all textiles. Now they're doing other stuff. Boeing, Open and Dream, Dreamliner plant down there near Charleston. So, you know, it's starting to go. North Carolina has Research Triangle, about 400 patent attorneys roaming around there. That's Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, that area of North Carolina. And then you're back to Northern Virginia. Okay, I left out Boston, about 1,200. Um, Minneapolis, about 400. Denver, 500. Seattle, 400, 450, but 200, 250 work for Microsoft. Portland, about 80 or 90. Um, and the Rust Belt. So what's the Rust Belt? Well, the Rust Belt is New Jersey, and then you kind of unhitch it and you drag it west to Gary, Indiana. So what do you have? New Jersey, right? You're holding it. But you go through Albany, you go the Erie Canal, uh, all the way across to Buffalo. So you picked up Syracuse, Utica. You got Harrisburg, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati. Uh, Toledo, Detroit, you know, you have these places and we know what's happened. The Rust Belt isn't what it once was, okay? Used to be the largest firms in the country were in places like Cleveland and Columbus. These were six, seven, eight hundred lawyer firms. Yeah, because there's a lot going on out there. Not so much anymore. So when you're looking at the Rust Belt, simply look to the future. You know, Pittsburgh has a bright future, it just doesn't involve steel or heavy manufacturing. It involves fresh air and probably medical things, you know, because it's Carnegie Mellon and Pittsburgh Medical Center. So there's a lot going on in these places. Just look to the future, not the past, and ask the firms that you're thinking about in these locations what their future holds and what they are planning for. Because the past, I'm afraid, uh, is the past. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens. So uh, bear that in mind about the Rust Belt, but it, it's coming back. You know, it's, it's doing better than we might have thought it was going to do when we looked at it 20 years ago. All right, any questions about jobs and prospects and that sort of thing? Yeah, I have a question. I lost you a little bit after you mentioned about the Department of Justice to do, if you were to litigate patents. You had three acronyms that followed. I caught CAC, ITC, there was an S something. 
the reason I'm asking you is my background is hydraulic engineering. I worked for government for a long time. I have a master's in public administration. So I might be looking at government route. So can you clarify those three acronyms for me? Yes, yes. If you're going to litigate patents, uh, Department of Justice, DOJ, if you're going to litigate the PTO, that's the Patent and Trademark Office, that would be in the solicitor's office at the PTO. Uh, and if you want to litigate uh, in the International Trade Commission, that's the ITC. That's right, the government uh, is an acronym manufacturing. You see, that's all they do is create acronyms. So the ITC is the International Trade Commission. And what they do there is you get import exclusions. And so it's, it's anti-dumping and stuff like that. Well, patents are a part of it. And you can get a, an allegedly infringing thing excluded at the port. And so, uh, you know, Apple has been chasing people over the years at the ITC. Likewise, uh, Kodak uh, managed to get uh, some patents in the horse there recently. And CAFC? CAFC. Uh, ITC, CAFC is, is the court where you litigate patents. That's the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. CAFC, Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And all of these offices, I'm assuming Washington, D.C.? Yes, Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you don't need to be a patent attorney to litigate uh, in federal court. But would you say that um, someone who is litigating patents in federal court is at a disadvantage if they are not a patent attorney? Yes, the case, do you have to be a patent attorney to litigate patents? And the answer is no, but it's changed. And what changed it is the America Invents Act. Because by now, the patent office is gonna play a role in determining validity of a patent. Well, that used to be the province of courts alone. Now, if it, gets kicked back into the patent office. If you're not registered, you can't represent your client. You see, the patent office has a procedure where you can represent pro hoc BJ, you know, uh, for this particular case, but it's only in the instance where the client would be uh, unduly undermined by not having their favorite attorney do it for them. And this is the case of an independent inventor, not a company. So they have no, federal court sort of easy pro hoc vice, you know, you just have a little counsel, off you go. No, the patent office requires that anybody who represents anybody be registered. So I've had law firms contact me recently in need of having 60 and 70 lawyers get admitted to the, uh, the patent office. Yeah, so it's suddenly become not something that's optional. You gotta be registered at the PTO if you really want to litigate. Once upon a time, not so. Can you tell them to hire us? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, but remember it's your technical background that's gonna make, make the difference. All right, any other questions? I think we're gonna be run out. I'll stick around if you have any questions, but don't forget my email jwhite at pli.edu and come grab some stuff. You can go to PLI Courses right next door for free. Not mine, but any of the others. <laughs>